Hi, it's Neil here, and welcome to International Accounting. And in the first week, we're basically doing an introduction. And I want to take you quickly through some of the PowerPoint slides just to help you get a sense of what is International Accounting about, what does it cover, what doesn't it cover. So the learning objectives in this course, or definitely in this chapter, chapter one, is to really look at the nature and scope of international accounting. We want to describe the accounting issues confronted by different companies involved in international trade, import and export transactions. And also we want to explain the reasons for the accounting issues associated with foreign direct investment. Describe the practice of cross-system and foreign stock exchanges and we'll explain the notion of global accounting standards. We want to explain the importance of international trade, foreign direct investment, and multinational corporations in the global economy. So let's tackle some of these issues. International accounting includes a study of various functional areas of accounting. It focuses on accounting issues unique to the multinational corporations. This could be defined in three different levels, supernatural accounting, supranational accounting, company level and international accounting. Now at the supranational accounting, it's all about the standards and guidelines issued by the big multinational organizations, the big organizations like International Accounting Standards, FASB, that's the Foreign Accounting Standards Board in USA, the IFRS, uh, that's a big accounting standards board. There's International Federation of Accountants. These are big giant bodies that meet to decide what are the standards we want to adopt, uh, what are the standards that we don't want to adopt, and to get countries to agree on this convergence of international accounting. So at the company level, now we have international accounting issues associated with their international business activities and their foreign investments. So if Apple, for example, has sales from all around the world. So it's generating revenue from multiple different countries. And the, that revenue is generated in different foreign currencies. So how do we account for that? We can't just use GAP for the America, we've got to do some translations to get the foreign revenue into the gap-based accounting revenue. So when Apple reports its earnings every quarter, then we have a stable basis for comparing Apple's earnings with another company that is not international uh, in the same sector. So that's at the company level. And so international accounting is really going to impact those companies that have international businesses. What about international accounting? Well, this is more focusing on the different standards, the guidelines, the rules of accounting, and it, the auditing taxation rules existing in each country. So this is more about the country-specific laws, regulations, what they allow, what they don't allow. So for example, uh, foreign auditors aren't allowed to do audits in China. Uh, for example, that there are different tax laws in China, different in Hong Kong, and they're different in the US. There are different transfer pricing laws. There are different value-added taxes. We're going to look at all these differences across a number of countries in this course. So just for example here, we want to look at those three different levels. This supranational accounting, that's where the whole idea of whether we do LIFO or FIFO internationally is governed by the big accounting bodies like the International Accounting Standards Board. They decide that we uh, all companies must adopt FIFO or LIFO, and then they get all countries to agree to this new IFRS standard. So that's supranational accounting. That's above the country. Then you've got the company level accounting, which is really governed by what is the company's strategy? Why are they located in different countries? What is their transfer pricing, taxation strategy? in order to maximize the economic benefits for the shareholders of that company. Then we have international accounting. That's where each country has different regulations, rules and guidelines 
taxation, transfer pricing and accounting standards. Because not all countries around the world have adopted IFRS. Some have adopted IFRS, but they've adopted it in a particular way. And we'll look at some of those differences in this semester. What about accounting issues related to international business and the sale to a, finance, a foreign customer? Well, the first encounter of international business occurs as sales to foreign customers. For example, Apple, you buy the iPhone. Basically, if you buy it in Hong Kong, you're generating Hong Kong dollar revenue for Apple. That has to be translated in the US. Of course, Hong Kong dollar is very stable and very easy to translate in US currency. But if it's bought in Yuan, bought in Australia with Australian dollars, then that translation is going to change from week to week to month to month. Also, international accounting issues come when there are credit sales made by foreign customers who will pay in their own currency. So it gives rise to foreign exchange risk. So for example, there are credit sales made today, but cash isn't received today. Cash is received in six months time or in three months time. So that gap between the exchange translation of that revenue earned today and the exchange translation of when you actually get the cash paid in one month, two months, or three months time gives rise to some foreign exchange risk. And what we're going to learn in this course is how to account for that risk. So there's two things on this slide here is more about the actual international accounting translation transaction and number two, the international accounting translation that is foreign exchange translation. So we can have a look at an example here, an accounting issue related to an international business sale to a foreign customer. So suppose that, and this is not in the textbook, so do pay attention to this example. In February 1, 2014, Joe Inc., a US company, makes a sale and ships goods to Joe's South Africa. Um, we call it SA, Joe's SA. It's a Mexican customer, all right? So the ships, the goods are shipped to a Mexican customer for 100,000 US dollars. However, it's agreed that Joe's will pay in pesos in March to 2014. So that's February, March. So actually that is all of February. That is one month, right? 30 days, 31 days. The exchange rate as of February 1, 2014 is 1 to 10. How many pesos does Joe's agree to pay? Well, let's have a look at the next slide shall we so at the time of the of the sale accounts receivable for the american company is one hundred thousand dollars and the sales is credited for one hundred thousand dollars so even though joe's agrees to pay one million pesos that is one hundred thousand times ten pesos joe in courts joe inc records the sale in us dollars in february 1st as follows so basically the US company has created a credit sale transaction. Okay, so what about payment? Okay, 30 days later, guess what? The US dollar is now worth 11 pesos. What does that mean? It means that the Mexican currency has devalued by about 10%. Okay, it used to be 1 to 10, now it's 1 to 11. Joe Inc. will now receive 1 million pesos they're expecting to receive that, but now they're only worth 90, 90,909. So basically the cash that the US company is going to receive is only 90,909. But the accounts receivable that has to be extinguished when the cash is received is $100,000. So now we have to put that difference into a loss on foreign exchange. Okay, another international accounting issue that we're going to encounter this semester is hedges of foreign exchange risk. And that is, we're going to look at techniques to manage exposure, the foreign currency option and forward contracts. So basically, these are ways of which companies, they cannot receive cash immediately for a sale, like what happened in that US and Mexican example, example one. 
they're going to receive it in 30 days time and you just want to lock in that that exchange rate of 1 to 10 well if we can lock that in then we need to account for that contract that we enter into to lock in for that exchange rate so we call these contracts a foreign currency option that is one way of locking in or another way entering into a forward contract for the delivery of the pesos at 1 to 10 in 30 days time foreign direct investment is another issue of international accounting and so the issue we're going to look at is about the ownership and control of foreign assets and there are two ways number one acquisition you're acquiring the operations of a business in another country and number two greenfield investment where you're actually starting from scratch like a startup in foreign countries reasons for foreign direct investment very quickly sometimes you just want to expand and just go beyond your country and a lot of multinationals in the fortune 500 have expanded they're international they're in multiple countries and they're driven to different countries why to expand sales but there are other companies that may not have driven internationally for sales but they've actually driven because of the supply chain they still are international if they're sourcing from China but they're just selling in the USA they are still international other reasons for foreign direct investment are to enter into rapidly growing or emerging markets so we know a lot of the world multinationals around the world are trying to enter into China originally they came to China why so they can source from China but now they're trying to sell to China they're trying to tap into the Chinese consumer originally going to China was to come and reduce costs because you can get some widget manufactured you can get some jeans cut and sewed for very cheap for one third one fifth the price of doing the same in the USA another example is to gain foothold into economic blocks protect against domestic markets protect foreign markets and acquire technological and managerial know-how so quickly have a look in chapter one to understand some of these reasons for foreign direct investment other aspects of foreign direct investment we're going to look at next in international accounting in this chapter and introduction is the financial reporting for foreign operations and there are various steps one is the conversion from local to US GAAP especially if the company is listed in the USA they have to report in US GAAP now they have relaxed that standard now that that foreign companies listed in the US can report in IFRS but it's in transition and this is something that we can look into as we go through the semester the second step is to translate from a local currency into US dollars so first we have to apply the US GAAP standard if the standard have been used is IFRS or it's a different country standard that is in accordance with US GAAP so you need to do a translation according to the standard that you're using versus US GAAP number two you need to translate into a local currency into US dollars records are prepared are used in the local currency then we need to translate that into US dollars so there's step one there's step two for reporting for foreign operations okay another issue and we're going to spend a little bit more time in this during the semester especially have a project on this is look at international income taxation that's where we have double taxation foreign income taxes companies profits are taxed at foreign rates hmm and then there's US income taxes whereas the US will tax the foreign companies foreign based income and lots of tricky issues that we're going to look at we're going to look at how multinationals do their tax planning to minimize their overall tax uh, next thing we're going to look at in international income taxation are the tax treaties, treaties used that are used to provide release from double taxation and we're going to look at the objectives the objectives of the company operating internationally that is to legally minimize their taxes in foreign countries and home country and how do they maximize their after-tax cash flows and so we're going to look at some of the strategies that the large multinationals 
engage in to do planning to minimize their overall income tax but also to maximize their after tax cash flows. Apple's a good example. Uh, with US taxation, as soon as Apple has a repatriation of dividends from its overseas subsidiaries and branches back to the US, then that's going to be taxed at the US rate. But so Apple doesn't do that. It keeps its money offshore and what it does is issue bonds in the USA to get ta cash flow to pay dividends to its shareholders in the USA. And so that's part of Apple's tax planning strategy. We're also going to look at international transfer pricing. And this is a big issue for a lot of companies operating in tax havens. Well, the US government calls them tax havens, but they're basically countries like Ireland, Luxembourg, Singapore, Hong Kong, to some extent. US used to call some, if not all these countries, tax havens because they were operating and, and had a lower corporate rate than the US. And so that encouraged a lot of companies to set up regional headquarters or subsidiaries for the purposes of hoarding cash, hoarding revenues outside of the US. So it's an issue for multinational companies making intercompany sales where they would have transfer pricing. Companies use discretionary transfer pricing. For example, price negotiation between a buyer and seller is not feasible due to tax rate differences. Companies shift profits from companies with high tax rates to countries with low tax rates. Uh, exactly like I said before, Luxembourg, Ireland, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore have been targeted for this. Companies regulate international transfer pricing to ensure that companies pay their fair share of local taxes. This is a big issue. This is a big trend. Countries are going after the foreign revenue of their multinationals. Why? Number one, the local taxpayers love this, that the company country tax authorities are going after the foreign revenue, not the local revenue. And so that is, it doesn't, it is not politically disrespected by the local taxations taxpayers in the country. And so what you notice that US tax authorities are going after foreign revenue, not necessarily the local revenue. And so that's that's a good thing. That looks good for the US taxpayer. All right. So and that's the same with other countries around the world. The US, UK tax authorities are going over foreign after foreign revenue and not the local revenue. And that looks good for in the eyes of the UK taxpayer, the same for the Canada country. So there's this trend around the world where the tax authorities are going after the foreign revenue and it's politically in sync with the current governments in these democracies. So keep that in mind, that's a big trend that's happening. We're going to look at that in international transfer pricing. Performance evaluation of opera foreign operations. Should I know more about this? I think I do know a little bit more, but basically it's about when you're trying to control a subsidiary from afar, how do you control them? And so there's a lot of issues in performance evaluation. Do you make their performance accountable to outcomes or to processes? And once you do have outcomes, for example, profits of the subsidiary, do you make them responsible for foreign foreign currency changes? Do you make them responsible for other risks associated with the country in which that subsidiary is operating in. And so for some foreign multinationals, they choose to put all the risk onto the subsidiary. For other multinationals, they say, okay, we will actually de-risk your performance according to foreign currency changes, according to inflation changes, according to other changes, and to try and balance out the risk faced by one subsidiary versus another subsidiary. These strategies are different depending on the performance evaluation goal of the multinational. We will look into that later on in this semester. 
There are issues. Here are the issues in evaluation. Translation from one currency to another. The inflated price paid in transfer pricing. Of course, if you're in a low tax haven country, you want to have more profits in that country. That subsidiary is going to look good. It's going to look better than a subsidiary in a high taxation country where you use artificial transfer pricing to shift profits out of that subsidiary to the low taxation uh, country subsidiary. So we've got to sort of balance out the tax planning versus the performance evaluation effects of these transfer pricing strategies. And there are issues unique to foreign operations. We'll look into that. We're also going to look at international audit team. May not spend as much time on that, but we're going to focus really on the issues the last two or three or four years where foreign uh, where Chinese companies have been listed in the USA and they've been caught out in terms of their audit standards, in terms of whether the US auditors are allowed to come in and audit the Chinese operations. We're going to look at Sabane's Oxley, how it affects the operations of auditing the supply chain of US companies that have operations in China. So lots of interesting auditing issues that we're going to look at at this stage of international accounting. And then there are cross-listing on foreign stock exchanges. This is going to dovetail into the earlier one of international auditing. Again, we're looking at Sabane's Oxley. Soon as Chinese companies list in the USA, they're subject to Sabane's Oxley 302, which is an internal control re voluntary requirement. And they're subject to 404, which is a mandatory audited uh, requirement of having internal controls with that are complied with the Sabane's Oxley Act. So we're going to look at those two issues, but really auditing and cross-listing of foreign stock exchange bring up the same issues that we're going to look at uh, in this semester. And then there are global accounting standards. I'm not sure if we have time to look at all of this, but we're definitely going to look at how they impact on the differences between some countries and the USA, because USA is really focusing on GAAP. Other countries are using IFRS. We'll look at some of the differences, but we won't have a look at everything. We won't have time to do that. And the global economy. Yes, there are a lot of issues that we can look at here. International trade is constitute a significant portion of the world economy. The largest exporters are China, United States, Germany. That's always changing, but China has become a very, very large now the number two in the world in terms of a market that people are trying to sell to. The largest importers are United States, Germany and China. As I said, China now number two. Foreign direct investment is used to retain advantage over the competition. We're going to look at multinational companies, international capital markets. There are a lot of things going on here. There are a lot of moving parts. So it's not just accounting in the end. It's more about the economic measurement of international international activities. Economic measurement at the end of the day depends on the decision that we are making. If you are a shareholder, then the decision is all about what is the value of the company you're investing in. If you are a CFO of the company, the economic investment the economic decision may be how do I minimize tax? How do I maximize the cash flow for the company? There are a lot of different decisions. Once you know the economic decision, then there are different issues internationally that impact on that decision. We're going to look at them in this course. So that basically takes us through to international accounting. I hope you like it. I'm going to do my best. I don't know everything about international accounting, but I'll try and make it as enjoyable. And we're just going to take it step by step. Try not to have too big a leaps in your learning, but step by step so you can get a really good understanding of the big issues that are involved. So looking forward to seeing you in the classroom. Thank you.